and welcome to the show. Today is actually uh, our biggest uh, star yet and it's got a lot of sentimental sentimentality for me in that uh, our next guest was involved with my father's case, Lidamide, and now we, um, uh, we're involved uh, together, you can see John Pilger, an Australian, a true Australian legend, uh, who was there from Vietnam. For those of you who don't know, but was there on the front lines. Has been a rock star reporter. Has been doing things ever since. Lots of things people thought were conspiracy theories have turned out to be true. We've now become friends, and I couldn't be happier. Uh, look, he's here today. Hopefully, we can try to cover his remarkable life in an hour. That's unlikely, but still, thank you, John, for coming. No, oh, it's, it's a real pleasure, David, and uh, thank, thanks for asking me. You come, you have such a distinguished name, distinguished by your dad and by you, both of you, heroic figures, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, both of you have. Um, have been pioneers and have taken certain risks that the kind of risks that um, really mark out our society as special, mark us out from those who, who never take principal risks, as you've done, and I suppose your dad did, but uh, I... Uh, I investigated the thalidomide um, uh, scandal for my newspaper in London and, uh, uh, and spoke to your dad often on the phone, uh, followed his own career. He, and, he had um, two good Australian friends and allies in London, myself and Philip Knightley. Um, and we both tried to keep an eye out for him personally um, because we knew we knew what he'd achieved and uh, what he achieved showed up in in all those women who did not produce deformed fetuses and who were not scarred by the drug it's a uh, it's a wonderful life achievement. You, of course, have protected life in a different way in that you've revealed the kind of atrocious behavior that, that can't allow, be allowed to go on. And because you've revealed it, uh, we can assume that it's not going on, certainly not going on in Afghanistan, or Australia is no more. So, um, father and son, a great double. Yeah, it makes me a bit emotional, and it really is. I mean, I say this about everybody, but it really is one of the highlights of, uh, of my position is getting to not just to meet you, but to actually become friends and, and, and have breakfast together down at Circular Quay, and uh, I have to pinch myself sometimes, and the way we <laughs> laugh. Um, about various things and uh, because you do uh, only people that have sort of fought the system really know that the depths of the system you've been fighting it for a, yeah. for a lot longer than I have and um, uh, yeah some of the stories you tell me make my hair stand on there now I want to I want to start to now you grew up in Bondi I did I grew up uh, up the hill from here. Bond, Bond, right. uh, that's uh, that's only a geographical description because it was all downhill, really. <laughs> but it was, I grew up in Moore Street, Bondi, which is just behind the Wellington Street Public School, yeah. about five minutes from here, uh, in uh, in a little place. My brother very accurately described as a dump. Mm. Now you said it, it was it was the early late forties, early fifties, and a lot of returned servicemen when you were growing up, and there were a lot of them were drunk and carousing yeah, around yeah. the place. Yeah. Yes. Well, it was post it was post war, and uh, there were a lot of damaged people around. Mm. There was a lot of violence. Uh, what today is rightly identified as domestic violence. Mm. Soldiers came back 
terribly damaged, mm. often with the weapons. It's amazing the number of weapons that they actually Managed to brought take back. back. Uh, back yeah. Wall Street was full of them. Yeah. Uh, and we had, uh, I suppose it's extraordinary, we didn't have more, uh, and were more problems with, with, with guns, but it was, so it was, a, it was a street of war in many ways that taught me very early. I think I understood that, I, that these were good men, but they were really damaged yeah. by what had happened to them in places like New Guinea. So drinking was a big thing. Mm. <laughs> you know, it was Saturday night, you, you avoided all, um, hanging about in the street mm. in case you ran, ran into an old digger or a young digger weaving his way home with a couple of bottles, several of which he'd probably drop on the way and smash into the gutter. I mean, I'm making it sound a little bit too apocalyptic, I think, because, you know, there was a great deal of kindness uh, in the street as well. But it did strike me as a very young boy watching this, this is what War does. What, what is war does. Perhaps I didn't identify in the abstraction of war, but I knew, I mean, my, my headmaster at Wellington Street Public School, his name was Hiscock. And he, I don't know where he'd been, which theatre he'd been, but he was terribly damaged. He was an absolutely lovely man and a good teacher. But he showed us atrocity films. That wasn't uncommon. This is public, this is a pr primary school, yeah. This is a primary school. <laughs> and we watched, and they're still burned into my brain. Uh, that, you know, the diggers, when they came back, scooped up all this stuff. And he showed it. And he was showing it not as an anti-war act, but as a trying to explain himself. Mm. I mean, there was a reason behind yeah. it. He was too intelligent. Uh, I can sort of understand that, even though yeah. it might have misfired, but that kind of being trapped in your own pain. And um, it's a bit like being behind a glass pane, but trying to explain. And it's when I had the similar thing in my, when I was first trying to say, this is a big problem. It was quite hard to be um, a silent scream actually to get it to get it across to people because when you have seen things which are you're not about war crime, not uh, uh, the generals covering it up, the politicians covering the general, the media covering the politicians, yeah. it's like where do I start? Yeah. And of course it can make you look a bit nuts, but um, it's uh, yeah, it's you, you, sometimes when you don't know where to start, it you, you just you get overwhelmed. So maybe that's it for him. He just where, where, where were some of the things he'd seen. But you obviously had some sort of emotional intelligence. You picked up on that without either kind of glorifying war or throwing it all out. You knew that these were damaged, damaged people, and 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 you stripped away the propaganda. I think you told me something that your father or someone that you knew said. That's America. You, you, you yeah. heard the kind of term of the, this glorifying war. Some of it was propaganda. It wasn't really like that kind of thing. Well, I was fortunate. I had parents and especially a father who was a political man. Uh, he was, they both came from the Hunter Valley. Uh, he'd left school at 14 and been, his first job was as a miner and he was a socialist in those days where people proudly called themselves mm. socialists. Uh, he was less active as I knew him, uh, but he retained those, those basic principles. Uh, he couldn't go, he couldn't go um, uh, away because they wanted him. He was a foreman in charge of making field telephones and, in Sydney, and 
one of the things that burned him was that his boss was an American colonel who deeply resented that. Allies, fine. I mean, we're seeing there's almost a, that's a microcosm of what's happening Sounds familiar, today. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. And this colonel actually dressed him down once for not getting his men to work hard enough to mm. keep the production up. Uh, so he, he had an understanding, a, r- a really acute understanding of imperial power. Mm. Uh, so as a young person, probably thanks to him, I think my own intuition may have helped a bit, but thanks to him, I think I was able to make sense of the Cold War uh, and the the violence that it... um, Well, there were plenty of wars going on, but there was always the threat, as there is now, of of a world war. Um, So that, that... Consciousness, political consciousness, was was unusually alive in our, our uh, house up in Moore Street. Thanks to him and my mother too, who was who shared his his views. So I I, I was fortunate. Did you get into Sydney High, Selective High School? Yes, I didn't at first because they stopped. Uh, you had to do an intelligence test, and each primary school around here was allotted one or two to go to Sports, City High. Yeah. The year, my year, they took away the allotment. Um, then they brought it back, and uh, and I passed the uh, the intelligence test. I can't even remember what it was. I think it was. <laughs> Moving things around on a, <laughs> on a bit. But, but yeah. anyway, you know, you know, I went to Sydney High. My brother had gone to Sydney High, and Sydney High was the, the root of my great escape, really. But before we get to that, I wanted, you, were, you were an oarsman, and you were in Sydney High, uh, won the head of the river, which oh, is yes. quite an achievement. It's the last time that they... Uh, no, it's they, the second last time. Oh, right. They, two years later, they won it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we won't say which year, but... Uh, uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's a long time ago for me as well. And uh, But that's that's good. So you were obviously pretty fit. And you look... In, um, I see the photos of you in Vietnam, and you, you're a good-looking rooster. You obviously kept yourself fit and uh, yeah. enjoyed that. That and st- you still go to the rowing contests now. Or yeah, what? still. But yeah. I'm, you know, r- row- rowing. Well, swimming was my first yeah. sport. Yeah. That's what I loved, and where I learned to swim at Bondi Bars here. I was oh, yes. Bondi Swimming Club. Very good. And uh, swam competitively there, and for school later on, and then rowing. Those two. Um, uh, the rest of school was interesting, but by basically a blur. Uh, I know the feeling, <laughs> yeah. It's a means to an end. Did you go to university? Did you go? No. To, no, you went straight no, to London. I, was, I decided when I left school, my parents were expecting me to do what, though they were nervous. I, my, they didn't know what I would do. Um, but I, um, uh, I'd always been fascinated with newspapers, and I'd read newspapers actually since I was a kid. Uh, and I'd started at Sydney High. A friend, a rowing friend, and I started at the age of twelve uh, a paper called The Messenger, in which we got celebrity interviews. I think we got more celebrity interviews than the real papers. <laughs> uh, of course, we just walked in and asked them. Um, Fantastic. So, somehow, I just... The newspapers and the media represented the world, and I was absolutely convinced I wanted to get going. I wanted to leave. Yeah. Not leave in a negative sense, but I just... I can relate to that. I yeah. just, I, yeah. want, 
I want to see the world. In those days, people didn't get on planes and fly off somewhere. They got on ships and, yeah. and took, as I did, six weeks to get to Europe. That's uh, what my dad did. He was the ship's doctor. That's yeah. how he got to, because um, they weren't wealthy. Oh, really? Enough. That's really? how he got to London, was ah. to be uh, the ship's doctor. And he still kept his coat with the um, little insignia on there. And I think that's how he got there, yeah. About the same time. What ship? What the, I don't know, yeah. One, of, a of, one, one of the... Merchant Navy. Oh, Merchant Navy. No, yeah, oh, yeah. Right. And his family yeah. went to see him off. I've got a photo yeah. of them all standing together, and he's yeah. really skinny in his <laughs> uniform. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's funny things that he remembers. But so you got, did you work your way on the ship? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I left, what, I started on the Telegraph here in Sydney and got my cadetship, um, and, uh, which uh, was just wonderful training. I've always been grateful for it. And two other uh, journalist friends of mine and I left uh, uh, on the on the SS Breton and we were all 22 um, and the, the moment this thing left the heads and started to list yeah, I was convinced I'd made the most terrible mistake, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, not, not well, pleasant. It was only reinforced as the voyage went on. But still, we made it at a strange um, place called the Suez Canal and then finally Europe. Um, and I stayed in Italy for much of a year before I went to Britain. And you were sending the stories back to London or Australia or something? That's right. Yeah, mm. no, I haven't been to London. I mean, I'd written to, in those days, you know, I used to sit down and write long, longhand letters to the editor of newspapers in London and they'd send back a reply. Yeah. <laughs> um, that you and, uh, mm. How nice to hear from you, young man, you know. <laughs> I had a few very tenuous contacts in London. But uh, uh, it didn't really help me because I started on a magazine called Titbits <laughs> and, uh, and then, then joined Reuters. So it was starting to get a bit serious then. And then I joined the Daily Mirror, national, the biggest national paper in the country. That was a kind of home for me. Robert Maxwell owner, then? No, that was, he fired me. <laughs> that was some years later. <laughs> he, um, so when did you go to Vietnam? You look quite young in the, in the photos. You must yeah. have been um, about that time. About mid-twenties. You're mid-twenties, yeah, that's, yeah. that's why, yeah. and that's I what mean, struck me as... Yeah, I was about 25, yeah. uh, 26. You were doing 26. things that, I, I, as far as I know, other people hadn't done, and that you were, yeah. you were, you weren't pushing some sort of company line, you're there. Yeah. You're talking to the A, you're doing, you're not just saying, this is my opinion. You've got US soldiers there, and you're saying, yeah. this is what this guy thinks. He's from Alabama. He doesn't want to be here. Yeah. And, and you're not m mincing your words. You're saying, you know, we're killing. Which, well, which, it, took me, it took me a few years to find out. I didn't go to Vietnam with any preconceptions, actually. Um, I didn't understand it, as most people didn't no. understand it. The history took some understanding, uh, but after a while, I got it that it was a war against civilians. Yeah. And that did it for me. It was when I saw this, a war against civilians, when whole civilian areas were hit, particularly in the Delta and in the Central Highlands where I went, uh, and I then walk back and start to find out what what is this really about. Then I I realised it was just a huge scandal. Uh, this country should have been the two Vietnam should have had national elections in the mid fifties. Ho Chi Minh would have been elected by about eighty five percent of them, and that would have been it. That's why I like to hear you say that because. Um, you know, you probably your enemies would paint you as an extremist, but I, and I, I, I get. Well, in their terms, I'd be very grateful to them. But yeah, <laughs> mine too, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm so thin-skinned, but 
But I, it, I, it's the same as me. I didn't go there with a preconceived thing, but you looked at the truth. And the mm. truth was that it was a war against the oh, The truth was that, it, that, it, that it, everything was bullshit, the, the narrative they were putting out. Yeah. And, and here we were killing people. And that was just because that was empirically as what you saw. And and you and and, you, and and obviously the message the message was to put out the truth, which you did. Well, I mean, I I put out what I saw. I've always believed, as a reporter, that eyewitness is the most credible. Always, mm. that's getting more and more difficult uh, because there are so many forces ranged to prevent you from witnessing what is really happening. At least in Vietnam there was the facility to witness. So my first, probably first major piece was a series about a village that had been struck, which I saw uh, in uh, near Canto in the, in the, in the Delta. Uh, and it was it didn't, it, it described the, what had been done to the people. It didn't make any, um, it didn't draw any conclusions of it. But that was enough almost because that encapsulated really what the war was about. As I say, a war against civilians. My Lai, uh, which was in Quang Nai province in the middle of Vietnam, was only one of many yeah. one of many. It's a bit like collateral murder to say. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, this I knew, one of, I, 10, I knew of, of, of several myself. And uh, you, after a while, I mean, you, you began to think that was a norm. A norm. And I guess uh, that was that's probably why, it's probably in the back of the Americans' minds, the ones who were couldn't understand what the problem was. They're probably thinking, but everybody's doing this. You know, why are we the only ones singled out? And that's, that makes it even more horrific. They, they well, just they were doing it in someone else's country. Yeah. And they were doing it to take over yeah. uh, someone else's country. All of it unnecessary. Uh, actually, the, the North and Ho Chi Minh were very amenable to the Americans. Ho Chi Minh liked the Americans. I saw that I, I, on a documentary. I was quite surprised that they were actually supporting him to begin with because their attitude uh, was for self-determination and he was a mm. local and he seemed a sensible guy. And then something shifted in America and they decided, oh, the communism, maybe McCarthy or whatever, got, he got over, overtook it and they suddenly he became the enemy, even though... Yeah. Well, during the war, Ho Chi Minh was rescued by the OSS. Uh, the OSS were, of course, the forerunner of the CIA, of at least one branch of the CIA. Uh, and in, in 1945, uh, somebody in Washington sent a couple of advisors who, who immediately, these were, unlike many of those who followed, were rather wise, intelligent people. One was Colonel Archimedes Patty. Archimedes Patty sat down with Ho Chi Minh and helped him write the Declaration of Independence. And if you read the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence, it's almost word for word the same as the US Declaration. Ho Chi Minh was, wanted to be friends with the Americans. He knew that he was in many ways caught between, I mean, and China is a a traditional foe of that's Vietnam. the region yeah. of Vietnam. Uh, uh, he was caught between, in one sense, the Soviets and the Chinese. So he was looking extremely interesting man. He was looking for a way out. And at, at one point, he even he was writing these notes and sending them to to Roosevelt and later to Truman, none of, none of which uh, arrived. So all these wars that have consumed Asia 
Already, but well, in, in South Africa, I mean, the, the, the same story in Afghanistan. The Taliban yeah. were the same. That when I met them in 2000, they couldn't quite. They were like, we want to be friends with the Americans. We think we're cowboys. They're cowboys. You know, we have a similar view of the world. They, they were quite mystified. And yeah, and as you said, the, there was no serious um, attempt to actually have peace talks with them. Or they didn't want it, really that anyone who did have communication was just to cut off or ignored because that wasn't that didn't suit the long term plan. I think it was a it was a, a, a absolute contempt for local people. The, yeah. the United States is really a kind of nineteenth century country with nineteenth mm. century attitudes. They regarded the Vietnamese as lesser beings, yeah. these incredibly resourceful, clever people who in the end defeated them. Yeah. They regarded the Afghans. Yeah, so isn't that right? And yeah, absolutely. Did we? Did we? Australia? We tried to change. Well? Every, we assumed. I was saying, even from down to you know building them Western toilets, we which that got clogged up overnight. And, and yeah, they assumed that anything Afghan was stupid, substandard. Anyone that was well, building toilets. That's when the Americans used to like giving away portable toilets yeah. too. Yeah, People who didn't want to, they couldn't understand that there, there was no. A, 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 a attempt and comprehension that some sort of ancient way of life could be any good. Everything had to be American. I wanted to make a little America. And of course, mm -hmm. it, it failed, as you said. And they're underlying that. You, you, it's only because they think their, their way is superior or these people are stupid. Anyone that doesn't speak English or American is isn't necessarily stupid. You know? mm -hmm. There was a lot of that. And as you said, yeah, they got out and negotiated, they got out maneuvered, they. <laughs> Because just because someone doesn't speak English very well doesn't mean they're not very, very smart. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But you're right, I thought that was interesting about the, uh, uh, the way things flipped on, on Ho Chi Minh and he was um, uh, quite open-minded, but they, they were the ones that got more... Uh, and again, you saw the first, the first times of blanket. To, uh, it can only be described as propaganda. When he was painted, um, like when I was growing up, the, you know, the North Vietnamese were painted as evil and uh, the war was still sort of trying mm. to be painted in some sort of heroic light. And it, was, it must have been very frustrating for people uh, on the other side of our propaganda to, to see that we managed to paint ourselves as the good guys, mm -hmm. apart from people like yourself. And this is what I was talking about last night. You have a very important job because um, people in Vietnam or whatever can see at least not everybody in the West is running some overblown propaganda, you know, colonialist, uh, patronising thought. Someone, you are the voice of saying, well, I know mm. what's going on here. I know we're killing Vietnamese. Mm. I know it's been done for corporate interests or whatever, and I'm trying to. And the fact that you, as one man, are standing up against it, that's that must be incredibly... Um, uh, energizing for the people on the other side when they see you're the only voice i mean it's you know it, it's i know like when i meet iranians for example or afghans they are so grateful to me to say if i mean i feel like i haven't done enough i haven't done enough to help them but they're like well we're just happy that they did, that you're someone from the western war machine who at least could see it was going wrong and, and, and didn't try and blame it all on us and didn't, you know. They, they're grateful yeah. that, that anybody is prepared to, to take up because it, 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 to see that blanket propaganda is just too much. It's about humanity, isn't yeah. it, David? Yeah. I mean, you know, this abuse yeah. of humanity and that's what you revealed and that's what struck me when I, <clears throat> when I first saw a war. Yeah. Uh, I realised that all that many of the rituals around the war were to cover that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, once you go back and start reading about the blood sacrifices of soldiers in Edwardian times, and uh, nothing is new. We've no. just got more sophisticated ways of lying about it. Yeah, and I think that that's it. The, um, that's what worries me, is that, is that propaganda. And this has always been my motivation. It's not so much about the last war, it's about the next war. And mm. um, if we can um, 
if we don't stop the lies um, about, oh, we've got to go to protect, bring democracy and freedom to Taiwan. We've got to bring democracy and freedom to um, uh, Ukraine or wherever else the next place is, we're going to have a world war. Um, <laughs> we need to you know, be able to cut through that bullshit to say this is someone... It sounds like it's a kind of weird parody. <laughs> yeah, no, it's hard to believe it's... it's, it's it, it is hard. It's, it's hard to believe. For me, frankly, it's hard to believe it's still going on. Yeah. I thought at the end of Vietnam that all that... I did for a brief time think that all that mantra had been discredited. Yeah. I was wrong. Yeah. I know, if you saw a picture of Joe Biden with his mirror sunglasses and this old guy with a suit saying, we need to get more weapon, you'd think it was a joke. You'd think it was a card, no, like well, as if anybody... Look at it, he's a mafiosi. Yeah, it? yeah. That's what he looks like. Yeah, yeah, is. yeah. <laughs> well, like all our Nancy Pelosi and, uh, and Pompeo, they, they adopt, the, I often think that, the, you know, a country has its... It's film which sums up its movie, and the the American one is the Godfather. That's why they like it, and they secretly they they kind of want to be mafiosos. They think that that's great, mm. and um, uh, but that's not us. You, but it's becoming us, isn't well, it? Well, that's I right. mean, we've become so integrated. You we become are now officially integrated. You become who your friends are. That's right. They're I even use American. I used to rank on me. We use American words and phrases in the military. Like we used to have, if, if you have a contact with the enemy, it's just contact. Makes sense. But because we became so Americanized, they changed it to troops in contact. And it's like, well, who else would it be? It's obviously troops in contact. And it was more unwieldy, but we just started to prefer the Americanism, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever, even though that was more, more, even though it wasn't even us, mm -hmm. we've adopted this uncomfortable clothing of Americanisms, which, of course, may be the power of language. Chomsky might say, but you start with the language first and you end up becoming them um, mm -hmm. down the track. How, how much did that overall... Let's say it used to be called Hollywood culture, but the whole American culture, that I've come to believe in, is hugely powerful. It insinuates itself into almost everything. How much did that influence Australian troops to, you say that they start to use American terms. I think, I think it's hugely important. I think I, I've often thought about this and it's a good, quite an intellectual discussion. Uh, um, one of my, uh, I think it's life imitating art. One of my favorite, it's quite a good movie, Second World War movie called Fury, Brad Pitt. And, it's a, and it deals with the sort of futility of war. It deals with the, la the last weeks of the Second World War when they're inside, Americans inside Germany. And everything is such a waste because they, they're sort of kids. The Germans are hanging anybody that won't fight. And so they're basically fighting kids, but they can't stop. Mm. And, it's, and it's just kind of heartbreaking. But one of the things that happens in that movie is they do this blooding. They get this young person who's nervous and they make him execute a German in order to, um, uh, the, so he's no longer scared of taking a life or whatever. But that comes out before that movie. I think that the soldiers might have seen that and said, this is a great idea. We'll, we'll, we'll get our people to kill, um, uh, you know, defenceless people. And then, then probably also realising that then once you get them to do that, a bit like the Australian Alliance, um, they are... Uh, they can never rat on you because then that you know that they have murdered someone. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there are quite a few things which they'd got from uh, another one of the apocalypse. Now they'd um, there was a joke about immediately going back to uh, the Conrad story, rather, um, and they'd say someone had gone up the Congo, and that was when they decided, uh, a bit like Colonel Kurtz, the, the, the way to beat the Taliban was to be more extreme and, and to go into... Because I don't think it was any... Uh, they weren't killing people, some of them, because they actually thought they were Taliban. That's the excuse they're saying now. Oh, we thought this guy was a senior Taliban, and therefore we didn't want him released. What they were doing is that they were executing innocent people, Mm. to make a statement to the villagers to say, 
but you should be aware, scared of us because we are more psycho than the Taliban. And that was the idea, was to just scare the people and just have no intention of actually killing the right person. Yeah. But And I think that they call that going up the Congo. So they, they were making analogies sort of from movies and stuff that as they were over there. I think it was important. I suppose that, that the Americans brought theatre to it Though I, in this discussion, we have to be careful not to uh, uh, transfer the blame of our own societies. And this society came from, you know, the warrior nation of the world, Britain. Uh, Britain has been uh, uh, dealing out atrocities around the world for a very long time uh, in Malaya before. Uh, Vietnam, as I know you'd be aware, uh, that was in many ways a blueprint for Vietnam. Mm. When Brigadier General or Brigadier Kitson, uh, who uh, uh, made his infamy in Northern Ireland, uh, was uh, probably responsible for the British crushing the fundamentally Chinese in indigenous communist movement insurgency in in uh, in Malaya and they did it brutally mm. they did it more efficiently uh, that seemed to me the only difference the Americans were incredibly inefficient some of their bata American battalions were inoperable they were so bad I uh, had several of them in in Vietnam, they wouldn't allow them to go anywhere because they could barely drive the trucks. The British were never like that, but they dealt out bloodshed. That's interesting, and they just man, this is what the Ameri this is what I think the it's reverse evolution in that the Americans learnt all the wrong right lessons, depending on how you look at it from Vietnam, and that they just got better. They didn't get better at fighting the wars; they got better at covering it up. And the thing about the British, as you said, in Malaya, because I've never heard any stories about atrocities, so they, they just controlled the narrative. Lots of them. Yeah, I know, but they, I, it's funny how they managed to control yes. the narrative. Yes. Was, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and people think, it, you, I, I, in my mind, it was sort of an efficient operation, they did a good job, but actually you just said they just covered yeah. up the... They didn't let the stories get out. Well, you know, Britain, Britain supported the devastating coup in Indonesia. I've when, heard that that was in took yeah. power. And uh, uh, I interviewed one of the, the witnesses, uh, a former BBC guy, who described seeing uh, the uh, uh, arms being delivered by Royal Navy ships and uh, uh, all of it done at night, no doubt very efficiently. In the first few days, the, uh, the British sources in particular purported not really to know what was going on. Of course they knew what was happening. I mean, there were bodies being washed up on the lawn of the British consulate in Surabaya. There were bodies floating all over the Malacca Strait and so forth. A man called Hadi Broto, a, a lieutenant colonel or something, wanted, was uh, anxious to take some troops, Indonesian troops, from the uh, east coast of Sumatra, from the northeast coast of Sumatra, to um, east and central Java so that they could take part in what we now know was this terrible holocaust, really. Um, he found a Panamanian ship, and the ship sailed with the troops down the Malacca Strait escorted by two British warships. So the British were directly involved in as what you describe as, as a holocaust. Well, well I, I would count that some sort of involvement, wouldn't you? So they play quite, they play quite an active role, as did this country and of course did the United States. And as a result, when Sahato took power, God knows how many hundreds of thousands of people, CIA itself says up to a million people, were killed then. I know, I think this is one of the, and I hope it, it comes out, it's one of the sort of crimes of the last century which has never been 
really seen the light of day. But it's yeah. it's sad. The more I hear about it, it was really mm. quite phenomenal. Yeah, mm. five hundred thousand people at least just getting slaughtered. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you're sort of changing the face of a country overnight, and then trying to pretend pretending relatively successfully everything's Disneyland, everything smiles, and you don't have any communists here. Uh, they're yeah. all dead. Well, Shut them they, that's true. <laughs> they did. They they worked their way through the PKI, mm. which was the biggest communist party in in, in the them world all. outside China, uh, and uh, and and probably killed the majority mm. or dispossessed them or whatever. Um, I, um, again, it's this, I'm even, I suppose, I'm, I've never lost my fascination in the way this propaganda keeps self-generating in my own society. I, you know, I'm fascinated by it because I didn't realise in some ways I've been embarrassed of being in the British Army, but I, it makes me think what else did I think was great, which was actually just propaganda? But, but it's um, what you... Um, uh, it, that's a huge thing that they managed to cover up, that Indonesia. And, and, and what worries me, and this is why I think your work is so important, is to we need voices t to stop every war just being a, a, a complete smoke screen, a complete green screen ad, and, and totally... What we think we know is going on is totally different to what is actually going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. And it's not the fault of, of the British Army or the Australian Army or mm. the, the poor schmucks among the drafted men in Vietnam, many mm. of whom I knew uh, lay on in holes on fire bases with and smoked a joint with. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that, that it's not them. No, not them. Of not, course. No. But of course, it can't be done without them. So no, that, that's right. That, that that consciousness of of what war. Well, they're basically good people, and they're, they're the most uh, well. Like the Americans they might have to join because they're so poor, but generally, the people that join the military are the most idealistic, and they and and so that's what where I we come from the same thing from a different direction. That's why I say politicians and leaders of the military need to be honest because they have so much responsibility with the lives of these people and the lives of the Vietnamese or Afghans or whatever and we can't have crooks in those positions because mm. it's you know uh, people sign up they're ready to kill they're ready to be killed um, it's a fantastic resource and it cannot be wasted by people who are just using it to get a bump in the polls or some some other cretinous uh, goal. Mm -hmm. You know, we, this is too precious a resource to be wasted by idiots. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why I'm on such a warpath. I probably, it, it's, what speaking to you makes me laugh because it, it, it's a bit of a thank, it's obviously a kind of impossible task, but why not? Uh, and, and the more I look at it, why not? But at least we have to. Uh, it, it, it makes it, it buoys my spirits to talk to someone like yourself. Uh, it makes me think it's all kind of possible, um, <laughs> and uh, maybe together we are, you know, strong. But what particularly worries me is the American propaganda, as you said. And now the latest thing we're seeing is, oh, it'll be great if Australia buys submarines, you know, nuclear submarines, and we're basically going to become part of the US Navy, and they're going to they manage to convince us we have to pay billions and billions to really to go straight into there, and that's yeah. a good thing, you know, and, yeah. the, and the, all the big newspapers are running it like yeah. it's a good thing, and there's nobody saying, really? Yeah. yeah. What's, is this a good idea? Is this really a good idea? But that's helped by the unwillingness in Australia, uh, certainly today, and it was certainly when I was growing up, to address our history. Yeah. I mean, we're basically a settler society that's never come to terms with its in indigenous or origins. What, what uh, Henry Reynolds, our great greatest historian refers to the greatest land grab ever and I feel that very strongly having crossed that divide between 
Indi non-indigenous and indigenous people in this country that we have no sense of our own country. Yes, we have a sense of Bondi and the beach and uh, a beautiful urban setting and so on, but we're always surprised when the continent speaks to us with its mm. ferocity or that that we we try and denigrate the original people, those who live in as they want to live, uh, by imposing on them a kind of institutional neglect. I think that runs all the way through this society. They, our origins bear our true origins apart from a peaceful British beginning didn't exist when I was at school. They do exist more now, mm. but only just. Uh, and in not understanding what we've done in our own country, the wars that have been fought in our own country, I absolutely believe this. The fact that the National uh, the, uh, War Memorial, up till recently, up to the last few years, had nothing on the, what they call the frontier wars. That is basically uh, the unequal fight between the invaders with guns and the other side with spears. Mm. But they were wars. Sure. Uh, uh, when, I, when I made my last film that involved, I, had to, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to take the crew into the, the war memorial, so I went in with the sort of small camera that we're using now, um, and I started by asking people in the book, in the uh, the shop, uh, "Can I have a book on uh, the frontier wars?" What? 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 Didn't know know what I was talking about, uh, and it was almost like profane yeah. to mention this because profane against. All those poor young white men who had been sacrificed all those years of fighting colonial wars. Afghanistan. Yeah. Britain's biggest military disaster. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In the 19th century. And there it is, you're back there. We're back we're, there now. We're, yeah. We're, yeah. We we're talking about it before too. And, and I get angry when I read The Great Game. Peter Hopkirk. Oh, yeah. It's not oh, a particularly yes. good book, but yeah, it's not well written. I think he might have been a spook or something, but and I don't think he... Uh, um, if, sorry if, you meet, if, you're, if you're listening, Peter Hopkirk, but then uh, the subject matter is good in that, in that it's the same thing as today in that the spooks in Afghanistan and in the 19th century were trying to really make themselves, big time themselves by saying, yeah, the Russians are going to come through Afghanistan and they're going to take over India. Therefore, we have to do this war. And it's so like today in that the, the spooks are talking up to make themselves more relevant. And then, of course, it sold newspapers, or it was what London wanted to hear, so they're like, yeah, we're going to have to send troops out to Afghanistan. And they caused all this farce, and Russians, to a certain extent, did the same thing, which which was unnecessary, but just yeah. on fear and uh, selling fear mm -hmm. and selling relevance. And it makes, for someone who went to the modern Afghanistan, it makes you angry because it's so much a blueprint of what we did um, in this century, yeah. that it's just maddening to think that it's the same stuff which could have been avoided, but yeah. it was used in order to win elections or sell guns or, or or whatever, or even to make some dweeby guy in the in the intelligence services feel a bit more important. You yeah, know? it's like all those useless pitch battles. Yeah. You might as well have the charge of the light brigade. One of the great disasters. Yeah, uh, Vietnam was full of them. Yeah. Uh, they're all unnecessary. K San and all. We that. used to hear them, the, the, vet, the angry veterans say, oh, we never lost a battle, you know, but it was like, yeah. well, they didn't get it. Yeah. That they'd, um, yeah, that yeah. it'd all been for nothing. You know, we, yeah. we dropped a million bombs or something, but achieved nothing. <laughs> you know, we never, they didn't have the, see the irony in that, that very statement. We never lost a battle, but you, you know, you never achieved anything with the, yeah. with any, with their battle. Yeah. 
But you've achieved a lot. I don't know whether we're getting hurried up, and I, and I can't tell you how grateful I am. We've only kind of touched on your life, but um, uh, I'm so grateful to, to call you a friend, and, I'm, and we are so grateful um, for the sort of uh, the things you've achieved because the independent uh, voices will the only, and uh, really the only bulwark between a dystopian world. I'm writing my own book at the moment, and I remember, like it was yesterday, landing in Bangkok. I was only seven years old, and in those days you had to get off the plane, and I opened the big heavy doors, and I could just smell, <laughs> uh, I don't know what it was, but it was like it's 100 herbs and spices and uh, jet fuel, or yeah. I don't know what it was, but I just felt so exciting, and it's it's sort of thing that you've never felt anywhere else. The same with me, I suppose, when my, my ship left Sydney and made its way up the Queensland coast. Went off Thursday or Ellen for, for a overnight. That seemed to be a bit strange, not quite foreign, but then on to Singapore. This yeah. was pre-modern Singapore, yeah. just. Yeah. Just, I was so lucky to see it. I couldn't believe it. how exciting this yeah, was. All the boats with the long the propellers boats and everything. Everywhere. And Chaos. We, we, we came ashore in a boat, mm. Mm. and uh, which rocked about in <laughs> this, this uh, I mean, some people would say foul smelling harbour, but it was a beautiful foul smelling yeah, harbour. Yeah, yeah. It was the, the smells. The smells of exotica, of Asia, of another people, yeah. of things that were different. I think that's what separates. Yeah, that's the same. I can other people. You would see it. It's a lens you look at. You and I have got the same lens. I loved all that. Yeah. I didn't see chaos, and I, I saw it as history. Yeah. Uh, and a real life about the people. You know, you were smoking the cheap cigarettes and having a, you know, a, a, a one dollar meal in a, in a back alley. Well, that's yeah. all. That's all absolutely part of it. You know, yeah. um, I, uh, uh, I, yeah, I loved it, and I had a, I had a souvenir from the uh, Vietnam War, which was a. It was a, a, a black, a velvet sort of covered uh, dinner jacket, and and it had it was made in Saigon, and it had it was still called at Saigon, and they had um, the American serviceman's name tape, Purvis G. Rollins the third, I think he was. And <laughs> 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 he had it made up in the tailor. <laughs> <laughs> he decided. It like something you make up, but you do. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Truth is stranger than fiction, you know, and. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, no, I, and that would have been a very exciting time there. And yeah. you said it's still, even now, it's a sort of, um, it's the template. And even when the Americans, uh, after saying it was never going to happen, took off from the embassy roof in Kabul, um, of course, everyone is just relating it back to the famous taking off from the embassy in, in, in Saigon. And, and, and again, your, your, your interviews with American soldiers uh, in, in Vietnam saying they don't want to be here, um, it's just crazy. I think that that it must have been one of the first time people weren't seeing some sort of sanitised version. You were mm. showing the people that the real... Well, they were, they were talking about shooting their officers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, several of those in that, mm. although they talked about it as if it was somebody else, had done that. And that's, there was a, a complete mutiny then underway. You'd arrive on the American firebase and uh, the officer would be usually, um, depending how he got on with the, with the, the grunts, he'd be, uh, uh, you could see him fairly easy, but it was, was in their gift for you to see their commanding officer. Uh, I found it, I found it absolutely So the apocalypse now is sort of like a, you know, a, a dramatised version, but that idea when they're in the middle of the field and like, who's in charge here? We thought you were in charge here. It's uh, not too far from the truth. Uh, but it, it, we saw that, again, Australia was just better covering than I, I was quite interested when I was a, uh, quite interested to find out when I was first doing my military law training that we'd had a, a, a few cases of people shooting their officers in Australia. It was kind of hushed up, but they had trials 
fragging their officers, yeah. you know, to say that we, we, we weren't so sane and controlled that that didn't happen in our no. own organisation. Well, th- this is, it's, it's organised violence, yeah, isn't yeah. it? And it's like shooting officers, but it was the officers in the First World War who were shooting yeah. young men, who were shooting 15-year-olds and, yeah. and being allowed to execute them. Uh, yeah, for, uh, uh, and that happened in the strategy, that the deserters or people didn't want to fight. Yeah. But the, um, yeah, that was what, and this is what I try to get, one of my messages is to say our war machine is not nearly as good as we think it is and, and it was just chaos in Vietnam. But even in Afghanistan, despite all that, you know, the salesmen are saying, oh, we've got this fantastic technology, surgical strikes or whatever. We frequently hit the wrong target mm-hmm. and all that really, really changes is... Um, and this is the modern war, we just say we got the right target. And that's why the truth is so yeah. important, because yeah. we lose, the, we lost the war in Afghanistan, but we just spent 20 years saying we were winning it. And if we yeah. go to war in China, we'll probably lose that, but we'll say we won it. Yeah, and that's, well, how, that's what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah. I mean, basically, it's, it's a proxy war between yeah. the United States and, and Russia, and they say they're winning in Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, you know, Every day you there's know, a story it about seems, it. It seems, read between the lines, yeah. you know, uh, it's clear that that may not be the case uh, at all. It's quite maddening for someone, because one of the, my jobs as a military lawyer was to was to sign off on false messaging. And so you can you can recognise false messaging in, in, in the newspapers. And, yeah, I get sick of it every day. That, oh, Putin about to collapse and great, great sleeps forward in Ukraine. And you... you you know, the, the real stories are even so more... familiar. Every day, every day there's yeah. some story, and you read it and you know that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie, and you wonder how it just gets put out um, mm. uh, endlessly. Like, if it, if half of it would be true, we would have rolled over to Vladivostok by now, but every day um, there's just a new... Uh, yeah, I think that this, they discovered a terrible thing. Maybe they knew it uh, uh, after Vietnam, I guess, we don't need to win the wars. We just need to say we won the war a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, because we're democracies, we depend on public support. And as long as the public um, thinks we've done well, it doesn't really matter what the hell happened. And as long as you destroy memory. Yeah. Memory memory in the so-called democracies, memory is destroyed. So... Uh, the media ensure that there is no context to anything. There's no historical understanding of countries. There's no historical understanding yeah. of of Ukraine, of Vietnam, of, of Af- Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, I know. Or when it when it happens, it's 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 too late. Um, a friend of mine who was a uh, a marine officer in Vietnam. Uh, who was shot in the spine and lost the use of both his legs. Uh, He went on a a lecture tour uh, with uh, a a couple of former comrades into colleges and so on, and we're talking about This is not the board on the 4th of July story that we've got made to move? Yeah, 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 it's not... not the same uh, sort of similar thing. Yeah. Somebody who was same sort of story. Uh, the same yeah. same people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, he was asked, and I say we're in say late eighties, so the war had only been over a dozen years. He was asked by uh, these college students, um, "What side were you on?" <laughs> Serious question. We, we, that would that would break you your Ho Chi Minh side. That would break you your, break your heart, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah, I know. I got I got lectured by um, uh, and they were quite. He might have been a colonel, American colonel or something, and they were talking about uh, uh, the laws of war or something, and they and they said something about Al Qaeda and the Taliban. And it was clear, and this guy was quite high ranking. It was clear he did not understand that they weren't the same thing. Yeah. And these are the people who run the war. Yeah. And um, and then and they'd say things like, "Well, we define them as the same," and you're like, "Well, you if, if this American like the idea that you can just say something like that, or like well, you know, if, if Americans don't do war crimes, and so if, if Americans did it, it's not a war crime, uh, and it's like you you." <laughs> 
you understand that that doesn't make any sense, but they don't. Um, you know, that's that's kind of sad to think about the uh, yeah. the, the yeah. We uh, Anthony Lowenstein were talking, and I were talking about that recently to say it, it, it's funny how. Well, funny, it's tragic. The people have forgotten Afghanistan already. It's like a, a year ago that it, that it all collapsed. Well, there is something called organised forgetting yeah. in the, the so-called public conversation, discourse, whatever you want to call it, or what the space the media governs uh, eradicates those subjects. You simply don't talk about it. Mm. You don't talk about wars that are not our wars. You don't talk about Yemen. Uh, where uh, Australians have been peripherally involved, but certainly the British and Americans have. Uh, we don't talk about many parts of the world. I always think the older I get, the greater tragedy is that we countries become like a, a word, an abstract. We keep using the term China. I went to China a few years ago and filmed there, uh, and I'd also seen China um, right at the end of Mao's time. And I was stunned by how pleased people were with their society, um, how pleased they were, how satisfied they were that things had got better. Of course there are buts, lots of buts to that. But before we start assembling all the buts, why don't we find out about other yeah. societies? It's like, a, it's like a social geography lesson that, that we, this we don't want so-called to erudite, mm. uh, enlightened, product of the enlightened population, hasn't got a clue about. Yeah. Uh, Afghanistan is the same. We refused you to... the wars. Just find out about mm. how people live. We couldn't. We just refused to believe that people um, d different to us could possibly have anything going for them. Yeah. yeah. But I love that about yeah, what you say about China. I agree. They've eradicated poverty. They've done a lot of things, and that doesn't mean it's right. But the idea we rule it out of hand as them being totally idiotic is just is, is quite yeah. disgraceful. Yeah. But I think the game because the Americans are driving it. I'm so grateful. Oh, I'm so, 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 so grateful. And you, you, you've, you. you've had brought a bit of star quality to our Bondi, our <laughs> show. So thank you so much. Oh, oh, and thank I'm, you. And, and thank more you, can we hopefully, so, um, we'll see privilege. you again very soon. Yeah. In rich countries like Britain, globalisation is well advanced. The disastrous selling off of the railways and the creeping privatisation of everything from health care to air traffic control. The financial pages celebrate a booming economy, yet one in five British children grows up in poverty. There are almost 10 million Britons living in poverty. The gap between the rich and the rest gets wider, and this is said to be a spurious cause. All over the world, millions of ordinary people are asking why they have no say in decisions that bring hardship to their lives. They don't accept the view of President Bush and Prime Minister Blair that there's no other way. In Britain, the fact that only 25% of the electorate voted for the Blair government is part of this great unease. Why, people ask, should we accept a system of winners and losers a system that puts a dollar sign on every public service and almost every human value. Why not abolish the World Bank and the IMF and the World Trade Organization and replace them with genuine trade and development institutions that are democratically accountable? And why not cancel a debt that condemns nations like Indonesia to poverty and disease? These are dangerous times. The one superpower left in the world has made its ambitions clear. This is a document of the United States Space Command. It says, the globalization of the world economy will continue with a widening between haves and have-nots. It says only military dominance will protect America's commercial interests. Why should we accept this? Why should our children have to face these divisions and dangers? 
None of them is God-given. All of them can be changed. 